The interest of, uh, of the lab has been for uh, many years uh, to try to uh, understand the molecular mechanism that control membrane trafficking uh, mainly, but not only the Golgi complex, and in particular to understand uh, uh, those uh, mechanisms that uh, um, control the trafficking uh, with a special attention to the role of phosphoinositides in uh, membrane trafficking. Um, during these years, we have used many different approaches, and uh, uh, one that uh, we have been uh, using, uh, I would say, in the last uh, decade has been to uh, study membrane trafficking by uh, studying those disorders, Mendelian disorders, that are caused by mutation in genes that encode uh, uh, some membrane trafficking components. Uh, so here is just the list. These are all together uh, roughly 150 uh, um, genes that are mutated in uh, genetic disorders and then code for components of uh, com uh, for membrane trafficking in the endolysosomal um, pathway or in the Golgi complex or in the endoplasmic reticulum. And um, in particular, we are studying a uh, uh, few of these genes uh, because we are, I mean, really convinced that uh, by studying this disorder, not only, of course, we can understand more about the pathogenesis of this disease and possibly, hopefully, find correctors for this condition, but also because we are really convinced that by studying uh, these uh, uh, gene products in uh, disease models, we can understand much more about their function, their real function. So. And that's exactly, I mean, how we see the study of Mendelian disorder of membrane trafficking in relation to cell biology, because uh, this is really a mutual benefit that we gain. Um, in terms of uh, being cell biologists, we learn a lot by studying uh, membrane trafficking disorders. So the disease I will talk to you uh, today uh, is the Lowe syndrome that is caused by mutation in the gene called OCRL. So this is rather a special project in the lab because we are uh, not only studying at the bench the function of this protein, but we are also helping the Italian families with the kids affected by this disease. So I was, mm, helped establishing the Italian Association of Low Syndrome many years ago. Uh, so this is an X-linked disorder that is called uh, oculocerebrorenal Low Syndrome. That's why OCRL. It's an X-linked disorder, so uh, most of them are uh, uh, male. And uh, uh, the major signs of the disease are ocular signs. So these kids are born with congenital cataracts, and 50% of them develop glaucoma. There is a, a central nervous system involvement that is manifested at birth by central hypotonia, and later on with the psychomotor retardation of different extent. And then there is the kidney problem. It is very important. It is uh, a renal Fanconi syndrome. Uh, that is a syndrome in which the uh, proximal tubular cells are not functioning. And so these cells are those that are responsible for the reabsorption of low molecular weight proteins and salt. And so if they don't function, then this means that uh, these components are lost with urine. So there is a loss of uh, salts and bicarbonates. And so these kids de develop a severe acidosis, and this acidosis, of, of course, compromise the growth and the bone uh, metabolism in these kids. And so there are uh, many important secondary consequences of these uh, kidney uh, problems. <coughs> As for many rare disorders, there is no cure for this disease. Uh, but what is uh, OCRL? I mean, is a, a gene, is a, a rather uh, big one. And these are the different mutations that have been found in the uh, OCRL uh, gene. As you may realize, there is a, a concentration of mutation in these exons. And so these are the exons that encode for the catalytic domain of this uh, protein. Because the product of OCRL uh, is an enzyme, is a phosphatase, but is not a protein phosphatase. It's a phosphatase that acts on lipid, and in particular on phosphoinositides and in particular on uh, PI45P2. So I don't know if you are familiar with the phosphoinositides. So these are uh, a minor uh, component of our uh, uh, cell membranes in terms of the uh, relative amount. So they are less, altogether less than 10% of uh, the phospholipids in our membranes. 
but they are very important because they are very important signaling mm, molecules. So they are called the phosphoinositides because the uh, polar head is an inositol ring. And this inositol ring can be phosphorylated in one of these three positions, uh, three, four, or five. And so they can give rise to monophosphorylated species, uh, PI3P, PI4P, or PI5P. But they can be also phosphorylated in a second position uh, among the three of them. And so you will have the two phosphorylated species, the three, four, the 3,5 and the 4,5 that is maybe the, the most known of these phosphorylated species, the famous uh, PIP2, is the one that was uh, recognized uh, uh, as the very important uh, uh, phospholipids in the membrane because this is the precursor of IP3 and diacylglycerol. So when it is cleaved by phospholipase C, it gives rise to uh, two important second messengers. And then, of course, there is this only one possible uh, trisphosphorylated species, that is PIP3. So this is the, the, the product of the PI3 kinase that, of course, you know, they're very important in, in uh, controlling cell growth. So uh, what <coughs> OCRL uh, does with uh, its catalytic domain uh, is uh, uh, to remove the phosphate in position 5 from PI45P2, bringing it back to PI4P. So this is a simple reaction. And, but why that is that so important? Because uh, as we will see, so phosphoinositides control many important functions in our cells, uh, membrane trafficking, uh, cytoskeleton remodeling, and of course uh, signaling. And uh, these phosphoinositides are uh, uh, differentially distributed in our cell membranes. Uh, so there will be a, a clearer uh, image of this uh, later on. But uh, these different phosphorylated species are not homogeneously distributed in the, in the cell membranes. For instance, the PI45P2 is uh, very much abundant in the plasma membrane, but not in internal membrane. Whereas, uh, for sure, PIP3 is present in the plasma membrane, but only upon uh, uh, stimulation of growth factor. So under control condition, you have a tiny amount of KP3 at the plasma membrane. But there are some of these phosphinositides, such as, for instance, the PI3P, that are in instead abundant in endomembranes, such as uh, in endosome or, or lysosomes. Other phosphinositides, such as PI4P, are more uh, present in the Golgi complex. And so the um, important information is that uh, these different uh, phosphoinositides can be interconverted because there are uh, many kinases and phosphatases. So OCRL is just one of uh, many different possible phosphatases. So altogether, the PI kinase and phosphatase uh, are a family of roughly 50 members. Not only because each of them has a specific uh, catalytic activity on a given position, but also because for any given specific activity, there are multiple isoforms because they are differentially distributed in the cells. OK, but uh, why phosphoinositides are so important in the cells? Not only because as uh, PIP2 uh, can be precursor of a second messenger, but because they are themselves key messengers. So, uh, and they become key messengers and uh, key signals, I would say, because uh, there are protein domains that can uh, specifically recognize any given uh, phosphorylated uh, uh, species of phosphoinositides. So maybe you have uh, uh, met in your studies uh, protein domains such as the Plex trinomology domain, the pH domain. And so some of them, for instance, are rather specific for PI4P or for PI45P2. And so if uh, on a given membrane you have, uh, uh, for instance, PI45P2, this will induce the recruitment of a specific set of protein that can recognize PI45P2 on those membranes. And so by doing so, these phosphoinositides are acting really as a membrane organizer. So if you have a given phosphoinositides, then you will have a given set of cytosolic protein associated with that uh, membranes. And indeed, the phosphoinositides together with the, the RAB GTPases have been proposed to act as uh, uh, identity code for our internal membranes. Uh, for instance, in, in, the, uh, endos in the endosomal system, the uh, combination of PI3P and RAB5, for instance, are, uh, is a key determinant for uh, making uh, those membranes early endosome. 
So if you have a, a, a different phosphine oxidase, then on, on that membrane, because there is a problem in the metabolism of phosphine oxidase, then those membranes will not behave as uh, um, really early endosome. And I will give you an example of this. And so phosphine oxidase are important because they uh, determine the identity of our membranes and they are involved in many steps of uh, membrane trafficking. Uh, so this is a nicer picture of what I was telling you. So PI45, P2 uh, here in green is uh, uh, present mainly in the plasma membrane, where PI, P3 is present only upon stimulation. And you have PI3P in the uh, endocytic system uh, uh, together with uh, the bisphosphorylated species uh, 3, 5 and 3, 4. And you have PI4P mainly at the Golgi. And OCRL uh, is present in in uh, many different compartments, such as in the plasma membrane, in the uh, endosomal system, and uh, uh, some of it also in the Golgi complex. So today what I want to tell you uh, is uh, I'm just to give you an example of how we approach the study of a genetic disorder of membrane trafficking, as, uh, mainly uh, by combination of uh, uh, three approaches, I would say. So a classical cell biology approach in which uh, we want to test an hypothesis, uh, and then an unbiased approach, and then how we can uh, uh, exploit the knowledge that we gain in the cell biology of that uh, uh, gene product to develop uh, an assay that we can use to set up a, a high content screening looking for correctors of that condition. So in the case of the OCRL, uh, what I will tell you really briefly is uh, what we have learned by studying the role of OCRL in the uh, endocytic trafficking in proximal tuberous cells, that are the cells that are mainly affected in the disease, how we exploited this knowledge to uh, uh, set up an assay that we have used to screen uh, small molecule library to identify correctors for uh, 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 this uh, condition, uh, at least in the cellular system. And uh, at the end, I will tell you uh, about our fresh results, unpublished results, on uh, what we learned by applying an, uh, an unbiased approach to the study of this condition. So uh, of course, these uh, are not uh, uh, isolated approach because they are very nicely uh, uh, synergizing. So the, uh, as I told you, we started studying the role of OCRL in membrane trafficking in proximal tuberous cells, uh, just starting from the main sign of the disease, that is the inability of the proximal tuberous cells to reabsorb uh, salt and low molecular weight protein. And uh, this process in the kidney is uh, really a, a, a membrane trafficking process because the low molecular weight uh, protein are reabsorbed by the cells through this receptor that is megalin, is a member of the LDR uh, receptor related protein family. It's called megalin because it's huge. <laughs> and uh, this megalin is present on the apical surface of proximal tuberous cells and binds uh, its ligands. It's also called multi-ligand receptor because it can bind many different low molecular weight proteins. So once megalin uh, uh, binds uh, its uh, ligand, then uh, ligand and megalin are internalized by a clattering coated mediated uh, uh, endocytosis. And once at the endosomes, uh, due to the lower pH, uh, uh, the complex uh, dissociates. So the, rece the receptor uh, is recycled back to the plasma membrane for a new round of trafficking. And whereas the ligand is delivered to the uh, deeper endocytic compartment for degradation. So in order to have an efficient uh, uh, reabsorption, you have to have a very, very efficient recycling of megalin uh, between the endosome and the uh, apical uh, uh, surface. And so we thought maybe this is uh, the step in which OCRL is playing uh, a role. And so we have studied uh, the role of OCRL in uh, proximal tuberous cells also obtained from patients. So this is a an interesting feature for this condition because there is usually a shedding of this proximal tuberous cells in the urines. So one can uh, have access to cells, uh, to patient cells, uh, uh, just by collecting urines, urines and recovering <coughs> the cells from the urine, immortalizing the cells and studying these cell models. And in addition, we have uh, 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 cell lines uh, deriving pro from uh, proximal tuberous cells. So I'm just summarizing the results of our studies 
here with the, this cartoon. So what normally happens, uh, if you think about what has to happen during an endocytic uh, mm, event, is that you have a, a piece of plasma membrane that has to become an endosome. Uh, because you internalize this plasma membrane that then uh, will uh, become an endosome. So many different uh, 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 events uh, have to happen, but one of these is a, a conversion of phosphoinositides because you have the plasma membrane in which you have a PI45, P2, that has to become an endosome that is almost devoid of PI45, P2, whereas contain another different phosphoinositides that is PI3P. So uh, we reason that uh, uh, maybe OCRL might be important in uh, um, driving this conversion of phosphoinositides. And indeed, what we saw uh, is that when OCRL is not uh, functioning, instead of uh, losing a PIP2 while internalizing the membranes, and so having an endosome that has a lot of PI3P that is here in green and very few uh, PIP2 left, uh, when OCRL is not function, uh, functioning, is what happens is that uh, you keep a lot of PIP2 on internal membranes. And uh, this is a problem uh, for many reasons. We understood at least one of uh, these reasons. That is that the PI45P2 is a strong promoter of actin polymerization. So in condition in which OCRL is not working, not only you have a lot of PIP2 on early endosome, but you start polymerizing a lot of actin on endosomes. And this uh, uh, excess of uh, uh, filamentous actin on early endosome impairs the recycling of receptor that usually go through uh, early endosome and then, for instance, recycle back to the plasma membrane. One of these is megalin, the receptor we were interested in uh, for the kidney cells, but there is also, for instance, transferrin receptor that is not recycled properly to the plasma membrane, and uh, not only you cannot recycle receptor from the plasma membrane, but you cannot recycle receptor from the endosome, for instance, to uh, late endosome for degradation, such as the EGF receptor. So under this condition, you have uh, a much more EGF receptor still in the early endosome and still active in signaling. And for instance, you don't recycle the mano 6 phosphate receptor that usually goes back from the early endosome to the Golgi, uh, also, this receptor remains trapped in the early endosome. So what happens is what we have defined a traffic jam. So being in Naples is, uh, <laughs> is a rather direct uh, um, idea to have a traffic jam, and, uh, and the, in this case, in the early endosome. So there is no problem in internalizing uh, the ligand or the receptor, but the problem is in exiting the early endosome. And so uh, 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 then there was uh, other... Uh, uh, papers from other people working on OCRL showing that uh, indeed this is the case also for other receptors for other systems. Uh, so then uh, what I want to tell you is that of course now we are studying much more in depth the mechanism uh, through which the higher actin uh, uh, filamentous actin or endosome impaired the trafficking but at that time we thought maybe we can uh, uh, we know now enough to try to exploit this phenotype uh, to develop an assay that we can use for uh, uh, an eye content screening looking for uh, correctors <coughs> of this condition. <coughs> and so, I mean, uh, I don't know, you, you are familiar possibly with this pipeline, but uh, 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 of course the, the first and crucial step in uh, uh, setting up this pipeline is to identify a robust cell phenotype. Uh, that you have to use then to set up the primary assay uh, that you will use to screen the libraries of a uh, SIRNA, a small molecule, whatever. And so, uh, as for this uh, uh, cell phenotype, uh, we thought that the phenotype that we had uh, um, identified that is due to the mistrafficking of the receptor out of the early endosome uh, could be a, a very uh, black and white phenotype. Uh, what I'm showing here uh, is uh, uh, the distribution of MANO 6 phosphate receptor. So, so this is the receptor that uh, the steady state in control cells is mainly in the Golgi complex because it's the receptor that is mediating the delivery of uh, lysosomal enzyme from the Golgi to the lysosomes. And so this is the distribution uh, uh, the steady state in control cells. 
what happened in the same cells when OCRL is knocked down is that the MANO6 phosphate receptor is no longer in the Golgi, but is trapped in the peripheral early endosome. And so this is a, a clear different phenotype. So let's say this is a, the sick phenotype. And this is the normal phenotype. So our uh, simple idea was, uh, let's see if we can uh, find any condition, any small molecule that is able to revert this uh, sick phenotype to the control phenotype. And so what we have uh, done, uh, uh, of course, has been uh, uh, to set up an assay, because this is just a phenotype. But then you have to build on this a very robust assay that has to be uh, then applied to thousands of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, wells in your uh, plates. We are working on 384 uh, uh, well plates. And before investing in this, uh, uh, in this phenotype, you want to be sure that this phenotype is this is relevant, of course. And so you have to make a kind of validation of the phenotype. And uh, we did it by studying uh, cells uh, directly from the low syndrome patient, in which we verified that they present a very similar phenotype with this peripheral redistribution of monoxyl phosphate receptor. And then in addition, there is an indirect evidence that there is a problem in the mano 6 phosphate receptor recycling, because these patients uh, have higher lysosomal uh, uh, enzyme, higher level of lysosomal enzyme in the plasma, <coughs> meaning that possibly there is a mistargeting of this lysosomal enzyme to the lysosome, possibly due to uh, the mistrafficking of mano 6 phosphate receptor. So I will go uh, quickly. So if you are interested in this, then we can uh, discuss. So we have. Uh, a, a platform at TGEM uh, with uh, the two uh, I, uh, automated microscopy from Perkin Elmer. One uh, is the big opera, the other one is the operetta, uh, liquid handler, and all the system. So, just to tell you that we have sc screened uh, um, this library, that is the uh, library of pharmacologically active compounds, LOPAC library from uh, Sigma. Is uh, 1,200 compounds. And uh, mm, here, just to, to, to show you the results of this uh, uh, screening. So, here you have the, let's say, the sick phenotype, the one in which you have the mano 6 phosphate receptor that is redistributed to the periphery. So, and in red and uh, in uh, uh, blue, you have the, let's say, the normal phenotype. And uh, uh, every dot here is a drug. And uh, you can clearly see that the majority of the drugs uh, that are given to OCRL knockdown cells are not uh, substantially affecting uh, the, phenotype, the sick phenotype. But there are few of them, few, that are really able to rescue this cellular phenotype, bringing it back to the, to the control one. And uh, now we are. Uh, Working on these hits, because uh, this is just a primary assay, you want to be sure that they are working uh, also on different kind of assay, all of them uh, uh, possibly relevant for the disease. And so here we are uh, studying the uptake of megalin ligand and testing uh, these hits uh, that were, uh, came out from the primary screening on this secondary assay. And now, I mean, this is the, we have now uh, 40 hits. Uh, we are now performing uh, uh, those response. And we have selected uh, uh, 20 of them. Uh, and uh, now we have, uh, uh, we are at this stage. So we have to uh, possibly um, come to have, uh, ah, there is a problem here. There is something missing here. So we have to, to reach a, a reasonable number that can be tested in animal models. So the animal models are a zebrafish model. So this should be a uh, fish here, but <laughs> has gone somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and uh, a, a mouse model uh, that uh, uh, is available uh, for the, as a, a model for uh, low syndrome. And so we are going to, to test uh, these drugs in this uh, animal model. OK. Uh, and then I'm coming to the last uh, part of my talk that, uh, uh, as I mentioned, you uh, are unpublished results. I want to share with you also to have your uh, feedback on this. Uh, uh, so what we wanted to do is to apply an unbiased approach to the study of the disease because, uh, I mean, being member and trafficking people, we were really very much biased in looking for the function of OCRL and looking at the pathway that we knew most. 
uh, but we wanted to just to have an unbiased idea and uh, we uh, looked at the gene expression profiles of uh, proximal tuberous cells uh, knocked down for OCRL just to see which were the genes that were uh, mostly up or down regulated in this condition. So these are the people that have mm, given the major contribution to the study, Giovanna, De Leo and uh, Leopoldo Stajano or the people in uh, TGEM and our uh, external collaborator. And so this is the new TGEM uh, in Pozzuoli. <laughs> no, uh, so this is the view that we have. <laughs> so here is uh, Ischia on the left, you have the Capri. <laughs> and uh, of course, I thank the uh, funding agencies that uh, made this study possible. And all of you for your attention. Thank you.